the second part of our two-part series around understanding the criminal justice system in America. Tonight's gonna to be a bit of a deeper dive into the details around cases that are seeking capital punishment. Our team here at the 1027 Healing Partnership has been working to put together programs as we come closer to the trial related to the shooting here. We've, programs are mostly focused on safety, coping emotionally and learning. Emery, Renisa, Lauren, just raise your hands. So this is our staff, this is our team. If you ever are looking for us, you would see one of the four of us. Um, we've done this with the strong belief that within ourselves and our community, we have the resources to be resilient in the face of something that will be inevitably very difficult. So look at the website, look at the flyers for more information about what's going on. And we look forward to seeing you at some of the other programs. And also, if you've never come to our office on the third floor of the JCC, know that you can stop by during the business hours and we love to engage with people in a drop-in way. So last week, Professor Harris helped to lay out the foundations of our criminal justice system. And this building block for better understanding for trials where there is capital punishment. Similar to the format from last week, this will be a lecture style event and questions at the end. And then there'll be an invitation for more dialogue tonight afterwards and then also ongoing. Anyone on the screen, you will not be able to come off mute, but feel free to type questions in the chat and Emily will have them asked at the end. If you're in person, you'll see that there are no cards in the back of the room and we'll pass those out. And please write down any questions you may have on those. This week, I'm just going to do a brief intro, as last week we learned a little bit more about Professor Harris. But David Harris is a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh, where he primarily teaches criminal law, procedure, and evidence. He devotes much of his research to police conduct, search and seizure law, and the intersection of race and criminal justice. You can find his books, Profiles in Injustice and a City Divided, Race, Fear, and the Law, online or in your bookstore or at the library. He is a creator and host of the Criminal Injustice Podcast. And then Professor Harris lives here in Squirrel Hill with his family and the members of Temple Sinai and Congregation Shir Tikva in Troy, Michigan. So welcome back and we're really grateful to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Maggie. I appreciate it. I appreciate the chance to uh, be with all of you. I'm going to try this out, see if it's working. Um, it's, uh, it is a great privilege and a great, uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to be with you to uh, help our community have the kind of understanding we need to go forward with strength as we face the trial that comes up in just a couple of months, just two months. And uh, I want to thank uh, Maggie and Renisa, who have uh, been such uh, good partners in this, uh, all the way down to helping me review some of the presentation for tonight, just yesterday. So it's all fresh and ready for you. I'm going to do my best to stand right here without moving so the sound is good, but don't count on me, as you can already tell. So here we go tonight, second session together, we're going to talk about capital punishment, its history, the procedures involved, and the differences between a capital trial and a regular trial, which we talked about last week. I think it would be to remember what we're not here to do. This is not about inside information about the upcoming trial. It's not about telling you or guessing about how that trial is going to go. I don't know. I don't have any special insight except to say that they never go exactly the way they're planned. 
Um, and I'm not going to give you any predictions and I'm not going to give you any opinions. That's not what we're here for. Those are perfectly good conversations to have, but not tonight and not with me tonight. Uh, here's what we are going to do, though. We are going to build our knowledge because knowledge will empower us. That's what this is for. And we are going to therefore have a very solid idea, a fact-based idea of what to expect when the trial comes. And we all need that. And that kind of set of realistic expectations built on solid facts and knowledge will make us as a community more resilient. And that resilience is what is going to help us get through the difficult experience that the trial is absolutely bound to be. That's why we're here. That's what we're going to do tonight in our second class. So um, there's more to say, of course, about why we're here. We looked at this, these images last week. Uh, you know that building, that's the Supreme Court. And you know what's carved over the doorway on the right side of the image, equal justice under law, a good aspirational message, as I was saying last week. It, it, we know we don't always measure up. We haven't always done a good job of measuring up as a country, but we are going to try our best, even in this situation in which it is very difficult for us, in which we have been hurt, in which our community has been badly injured, we are still gonna try our best. It is going to be our aspiration. And that's one of the reasons that we're here. We believe that we can bring about a good human approximation of justice. Why do we care? It's not, again, as an act of charity. It is an act of, uh, you know, making sure that the sides are evenly balanced or something like a sporting event. It's because of who we are and our values, our values, okay? Not somebody else's. This matters to us. It matters to us to get it right, to make sure that even in the most difficult circumstances, we try the best we can as human beings to bring justice. And it's sometimes very hard, but we are capable of it and we're gonna work toward it. And this I hope will help because, right? You know that lady and you know that thing that's hanging on the, uh, the wall in her office, in her chambers, that's what they call a justice's office, chambers, right? Well, as I told you last week, she's not alone. Here's mine. That's from my office wall. That was the gift of my mother. So I know that many of you believe the same thing. And that's what we're here to pursue and to understand, even in very difficult circumstances like this. So here's what we're going to cover tonight. First, we're going to talk for a few minutes about the history and current status of capital punishment in the United States. We'll move from then uh, to how the decision is made by the prosecution to pursue the death penalty in an individual case. Right? Uh, and this is, I think, something that is not well understood. Uh, and it's very different at the state level versus the federal level. Then we will move on to talking about the major differences between a non-capital case, a regular case, and a capital case. And for the way um, I use that, those phrases, capital punishment, death penalty, death case, capital case, pretty much interchangeably. They mean the same thing. They don't have different meanings. Uh, but this is the way that we'll use those phrases tonight, too. So here we go. A couple of things to remember from last week before we sort of start in earnest this week. Always remember that the same overall standard of proof applies in almost every respect. And that is that guilt, and since this is a jury matter, the death penalty that is, punishment too must be decided beyond with evidence that goes beyond a reasonable doubt and unanimously 
by the jury. Um, this applies in, in, in the scope of our work tonight together, capital cases, just like it applied last week. We have the same very high standard of proof. Um, in the law, there are many levels of proof. This is the highest that there is, and it applies tonight too. The other thing to remember from last week, the adversary system. Remember that this is the way that our system works. It comes sort of baked in the cake for us. You could think of it like that. This is the system that we inherited from the English into the American colonies and now all the states and the federal government uses it. And the idea, again, the judge is the neutral party sitting at sort of the top of the triangle. The judge superintends the law and the legal questions. And then the two sides, the prosecution and the defense, they bring their own best evidence to court. The, the judge doesn't bring any evidence. The judge is not a prosecutor. The judge is not putting charges forward. That's the prosecution doing that. And the prosecution brings its evidence and the defense may bring its evidence. What they all always do is they challenge each other. That's the sense in which they are adversaries, right? And you're going to see in the world of capital punishment, it works the same way, except it involves some other questions that, the, that don't often get the same kind of airing. So we're going to talk about that tonight. But it's very important to remember because sometimes things get, evidence gets presented in capital cases, and we can't imagine why is that lawyer talking about that. It almost always goes back to this, the adversary system. It is that lawyer's job to talk about that thing or that evidence in that way, even though sometimes it seems like kind of a lot for us to hear. So here we go. History. Just a little bit. We're only going to take it back about 50 years. Because if you went all the way back to the beginning of the American Republic, you find that there was capital punishment back that far. Wasn't a lot in between being hanged and being put in the stocks, right? The penitentiary, the prison as we know it, is really only a creature from about the very late 1700s and onward. In fact, invented right here in the good state of Pennsylvania by the Quakers. Penitentiary, be a penitent in that place, right? But we're going to come up to 1972, right? In that year, the Supreme Court had a case before it called Furman versus Georgia. And in that case, the, the death penalty was challenged, right? And challenged as a whole under the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, one of the 10 original amendments that says there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. It was challenged as cruel and unusual. The Supreme Court, in its opinion, said the punishment is not cruel and unusual in itself. So it refused to knock down the idea of capital punishment as a whole. But it said that the way the system is working in Georgia and many other places is wrong and unconstitutional. Why? It was too severe, used in cases that should, it shouldn't be used in. It was too arbitrary. Um, it uh, could offend the sense of justice used in certain ways, and it was not as effective as a less severe penalty. So what did they do? Remember, they didn't take the penalty out altogether. What they did instead was to say that Georgia, as it is used, um, is particularly wrong because it's arbitrary. It left the jury basically unrestricted kind of discretion to decide whether the defendant should be sentenced to life in prison or death. And that was wrong. And in that, in that ruling, in one stroke, they took out the capital punishment system in 40 states and voided over 700, or excuse me, almost 700 death sentences that were then pending. Right? Big move. But they didn't declare capital punishment gone forever, just done this way. It was too arbitrary, among other flaws. Well, it didn't take long for the system to reboot, as we would say now. It was just four years later 
that in another case out of Georgia, Greg versus Georgia, the Supreme Court says, okay, here's a system we can live with constitutionally, um, particularly with the, the idea of juries having no guidance, right? Now we've got a system for giving guidance to juries. We use a system of what we call aggravating factors and mitigating factors. I'm going to have a lot to say about those things in the next 45 minutes. All right. Aggravating simply meaning make the case more serious, more likely to be eligible for the death penalty, mitigating factors that make it less serious and make the jury less likely to give the death penalty. And the bifurcated trial system. Okay. This idea is that you separate the trial into essentially two trials or two phases, we sometimes say. The guilt phase in which the question of, are, is this person guilty of the crime with which they have been charged? And the penalty phase. Should this person be sentenced to death or life in prison? There's a lot more in this case, but for our purposes tonight, this is really enough. Right. This is the new structure of capital punishment, and it's basically still with us today. There have been lots more decisions, decisions about race and capital punishment, decisions about uh, developmental disability and capital punishments, uh, uh, decisions about juveniles getting capital punishment. But the structure here was basically set in 1976 in Gregg versus Georgia. Federal capital punishment has existed for a long, long time. Think treason, right? But it was really expanded in 1998, 1988 and 1994. You see on the left side, there's President Reagan and the bill that he is signing uh, extends capital punishment to certain drug crimes. And that got to be the reason that Nancy just saying no is standing in back of him. They're watching him sign the bill. 1994, it's a Democrat, Bill Clinton. He's signing a really large expansion of the federal death penalty statutes right there um, in 1994. So the federal capital punishment system is greatly enlarged with those two bills from what it was. It, it existed before, but now it's a lot bigger. A lot more crimes fall into the federal system or can fall in. So just to give you a sense of the trend of things, this is new death sentences since 1973. These are people being sentenced to death, okay? And you can see it really peaks in the 90s. It goes up, 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 up. And then the last 20 years, this graph goes out to 2018. The last 20 years from 2018 back to 1998 is just steadily falling, steadily falling. The 10-year trend, the 20-year trend, you can see it just straight downward. And it's at a point now where capital punishment, both new sentences and executions are much less common than they used to be. Um, uh, some change in certain aspects of public opinion, public support for the death penalty system. Um, the question here is, do you believe the death penalty is applied fairly? And the green line, people who uh, think it's applied fairly, uh, trending sort of slowly downwards, uh, last measure in 2018 at 49%. The no, it's not fairly black line underneath trending upward since uh, the mid 2000s, it looks like. And now it's about 45%. If, it, if current trends continue, you see those lines are bound to cross at some point. Um, this is the way the, the current status of the death penalty looks in the states. If you count the two states in gray, Oregon and Pennsylvania, that as of the time of this graphic had a gubernatorial moratorium on the books, okay, meaning uh, they have the death penalty, but a governor, Tom Wolf, in our case, announced no more death sentences under me. Um, the states are roughly evenly split, roughly 50-50 in terms of who's got the death penalty on the books and who does not, okay? Um, 
But the thing to notice in the states, beyond just the declining use of the death penalty, uh, is that most of it comes in just a few states. Uh, and these two are, the, are your leaders. Texas, especially. There are counties in Texas, counties in Texas that have uh, uh, passed more death sentences and executed more people. That counties don't execute them, the state does, but the death sentences come out of those counties than a whole bunch of states. Right? Texas and Oklahoma are where it happens. And then within those states, it is further concentrated. Um, this isn't exactly the same thing, but it's the best thing I could find. So this is executions, not death sentences themselves. People getting executed. Uh, four of the top five local counties in the country that produce cases that result in executions, four of the top five are in Texas. That one of the top five is in, in Oklahoma. Right? And uh, you can see there are, there are at least two other counties in Texas in the top 10. Right? So it's very concentrated. And the reasons for that we're going to talk about in just a couple of minutes when we talk about who decides. So, so much for the history, the current status. What really makes these things different? And I'm going to just sketch it out here as we go a little deeper and a little deeper over the next few minutes. Um, Non-death penalty trials on the left side, death penalty trials on the right side, okay? Uh, each of these things I'm about to show you will go into greater detail as we go on, all right? Uh, first thing that happens in most cases after an arrest is the charges come. They might come in an indictment or in a prosecutor's information, which is just a sworn document. In a death penalty trial, yes, there are charges, there has to be a very particular kind of notice that uh, the, the state is seeking the death penalty. And that notice usually has to list two of the things I talked about a minute ago, the aggravating factors or mitigating factors for the trial. Usually they're focusing on aggravating factors, right? Because uh, you have the state or even the federal government saying, we're going for the death penalty and has to appear in the charges. Next, you have jury selection. We talked about that last week. And you have jury selection on the death penalty side too, but usually you need a bigger pool of people and you have something that doesn't appear on the left side called death qualifying the jury. And we're gonna, we're gonna get into detail, I promise you. You have to have a death qualified jury. Right? Very, very important. Next. On the left side, non-capital cases, jury decides whether or not the person is guilty or not guilty. That's it. Goodbye. Thank you for your service. You're finished. On the death penalty side, of course, there are two phases of the trial. The jury decides guilty or not guilty and then goes into what is effectively a separate trial on what should the penalty be, death sentence or life sentence. Right, so the jury is actually deciding the penalty too. On the left side, non-death cases, the judge is deciding and imposing the sentence. The judge imposes the death sentence, but usually only in a formal way. Right, the jury decides. No, it's a death penalty, and then the judge announces the sentence. And the same jury, by the way, in a capital case, same jury all the way through. That's a lot of work, among other things. Right. So that's the general layout. Here we go a little bit deeper. Important to understand. We talked last week a lot about there being a state system and a federal system and they're overlapping jurisdiction. Right. For the federal system, most of the time we're talking about some some peculiar interest of the federal government, interstate crimes, things like that. Uh, and they could have certain federal crimes that call for the death penalty uh, that the states wouldn't have. Treason it would be one. Right? Um, the state will have general jurisdiction over criminal cases, including the death penalty cases, if they have capital punishment. But one thing to understand is that legal change in one level does not change anything at the other. 
right? So if the U.S. Attorney General announces tomorrow, uh, I'm against the death penalty and I'm not going to bring any more death penalty cases, it has no effect whatsoever on Pennsylvania, none, or any other state, right? And vice versa. They overlap. You will see them sometimes, as we have in other states and in Pennsylvania, kind of competing with each other. Who's going to go first? Who's going to bring the case? Maybe both. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So they can both have an interest in any one particular case. But how each operates, if they make legal changes in their systems and in their law, one doesn't change the other. It's important to understand. All right. So how does that state versus federal thing work? All right. We talked about this some last week, but it's really important in the, oops, in the, in the capital punishment realm. All right. Uh, can there be both federal and state cases? Yes. All right. They can both bring charges kind of in parallel. Then the questions become, okay, whose case is it? Who will go first? And there are no real rules for that. It's a little bit of the Wild West. Okay? It, they may easily come to an agreement. They may come to an agreement between the county prosecutor and the Department of the Federal Department of Justice. No, no, we want the feds to go first, or vice versa, for their own reasons. Um, and you can have a trial or, or a plea even in one realm, the state realm, the federal realm, followed by a proceeding from the other. They may feel they have very good reasons to do both, or it may be just one. One may be capital, the other not. Okay? Uh, if you think about the case involving the uh, horrific events in Buffalo, the one where the sentencing occurred last week, um, that was a state case, but the federal government may yet bring its own charges. New York State does not have capital punishment. We know the federal government does. And that may be the basis for the federal government deciding, no, no, we're going to do it too. Right? And they make their decisions independently, but with, with each other very much in mind. And then the question is, who makes the decision? to ask for capital punishment. We know the jury will ultimately decide whether to give a death sentence or a sentence of life in prison in any particular case, but somebody, some agency, somebody is making the decision to go for the death penalty. I wish I had a better way to say that, but one level of government or the other, some actor, is making a determination, this must be a capital punishment case. And then they have to file that notice that I was talking about along with the charges saying, we are going to request a death sentence. We're gonna ask the jury to do that, okay? So who does that and how does it work? That's where we're gonna go right now, right? Who decides, right? Left side of the screen, the state, and here, represented in our county by the Allegheny County District Attorney's Office. On the other side, on the federal side, the Department of Justice. All right. So who decides? Well, on the state level, it's pretty simple. The county prosecutor decides, right? In all but three of the states, the prosecutor when we talk about the prosecutor or our local DA or our local state's attorney, where I grew up in Illinois or where I practice in the state of Maryland, um, this is a, a local elected official, local, uh, uh, elected county by county. There are a few states that use groups of counties as a district, like Florida, right? But that local official makes the decision. And he or she may have a committee of people in the office who review the case and make recommendations, but nothing requires that. It does not require the governor say so. It does not require the state attorney general to sign off on. It. It's the local DA. 
So Mr. Zapala here in Pittsburgh, if he should choose in any particular case, he thinks this is a death penalty case. Hopefully he gets some advice from his staff. Uh, they tell him, yes, it would qualify. It's one of those statutes that if the person is found guilty, it qualifies for the death penalty. The death penalty is one of the possible penalties. Mr. Zapala can decide for himself. And that's it. There's no review of that. It just depends on what the local elected official thinks. The federal system could not be more different in this respect. It is a multi-stage process with multiple actors weighing in stages of review, um, uh, 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 seeing input from people you might not even expect. So. This is the, the left side is simple. That's all. That's it. But we need to drill into the federal side to really get a sense of how that decision is made. Right? Why do we does the federal system have such a process before we even describe what it is? Why would they have that? Why the complicated levels of decision making? Well, number one, remember that the federal system is the entire country. Right. I showed you some graphics a few moments ago about how certain states really seem to use capital punishment a lot. And then within those states, there are even some counties that use it a ton and counties that don't use it at all. Right. The federal government is a national government and you can't you can't have justice if the representatives of the federal government in Oklahoma are doing this a lot and the federal of officials in New York state are doing it not at all. All of a sudden, it would depend on where you live, just like states. And it's a national government, so they have to have national uniformity. This is always a goal of federal law enforcement and federal law in general, right? You try to have national standards so things are operating the same way everywhere. Number two, you don't want to have the appearance of arbitrary outcomes. And that's what you would have if there weren't some mechanism for trying to keep things uniform. It would look like the federal law was a lot worse or a lot more severe in Oklahoma than in Oregon, right? And it just won't do on a certain level. And then third, it's the ambition to take extra care with these cases. Now, that will vary from time to time and attorney general to attorney general. Some really favor capital punishment generally, others don't. But the process that is built in, and it is built in through longstanding Justice Department regulations, the process is there to try to take real care with these cases. Not that they never do anything wrong or don't make a mistake ever, but you minimize the chances for that when you have a process like I am about to describe, okay? First thing to understand, how does federal law enforcement work, right? You've got the Department of Justice is a gigantic federal agency. Hundreds of thousands of people work at the Department of Justice in lots of different capacities, right? One only one of the things it does is to enforce the criminal law. It does so much more, right? But when we say the Department of Justice is seeking the death penalty or not, what we're talking about is, is always a case that is happening in a particular location within the United States, right? So we have to understand who would be making these decisions or operating sort of on the ground. And this is how it works. The U.S. Department of Justice has a frontline prosecutor, kind of like a local district attorney, in, one, uh, in every one of 94 federal districts. The United States is broken up for purposes of its federal trial courts and its prosecution efforts into 94 federal districts. This, this map of the United States here, uh, I know it's a, the, the printing is a little small, forget about the printing, but you can see that some states, it's just 
you know, one state with the abbreviation, look at Montana all the way up at the top or Arizona towards the bottom. That means one federal district for that whole state. But if you look at California, there are four federal districts, right? There is California Eastern, California Northern, California Central, California Southern, New York, four districts. Well, how about PA? There we are. Right? Pennsylvania, three federal districts. Western District of Pennsylvania, all the way on the left side of the screen in the blue. Middle District of Pennsylvania, in the middle. And then the Eastern District, blue at the right side of the left image. All right. And you can see, I really like this. I wish there were names in there like there are in this one. But each one of those districts is made up of a certain number of Pennsylvania counties and we're kind of spreading the population. Right. So we're over here in the Western District. You can see the outline of Allegheny County, but it's also 25, 26 other counties, all part of the same federal district. Right? So when a jury is called, a jury pool is summoned for a trial in the Western District of Pennsylvania, it isn't, even if the case is only from Pittsburgh, the jury is not just summoned from Pittsburgh. It is summoned from all 26 of those counties in the blue. Right? Same thing with the middle, which is basically Harrisburg and all the rest that's in the middle, and then in Philadelphia and a few of those counties around it. Right? And each one of those has a U.S. attorney, the frontline prosecutor. And that, you know, in, in any sizable district, the U.S. attorney will have a staff of prosecutors, assistant U.S. attorneys working for her to carry out the business of the office. This is where a death penalty case will start in the federal system, in a particular federal district. All right. So who decides whether to ask for a federal death sentence? And remember, it's an ask. You're asking the jury to do this after hearing all the evidence. Who makes the decision to go in that direction as opposed to not? First thing that happens is the U.S. attorney's office in that place, in that district, writes a memo in every single case that might qualify for the death penalty. Every single one gets a detailed memo up to the Department of Justice in Washington, the criminal division, um, and it outlines the case. The fact that they write this doesn't mean that they recommend the death sentence, right? So that memo may or may not recommend the death sentence, and they make no recommendation either way, but they have to write it. It's required, and up that memo goes to Washington. It is then given to what's called the Capital Review Committee. And the Capital Review Committee is a high ranking people in the Department of Justice. There may be some other people from U.S. attorneys' offices brought in, and they review that memo. And they begin to go through the pluses, the minuses, the yeses, the noes about whether it should be a capital case or not. Right? And it's they're sifting through it, they're looking at the, the, the description of the evidence, and they're getting even more information than that. Um, they're required to notify defense counsel and to give defense counsel an opportunity to be heard on whether they should pursue the death penalty or not. They also reach out to victims' families with the same kind of information and input from their point of view, what do they think? And then, and only then, they make a recommendation. They, uh, a subset of the people on the Capitol Review Committee make a recommendation to the Attorney General, right? Last Attorney General in the Trump administration, William Barr on the left, Merrick Garland, the current, Attorney General uh, in the Biden administration, that one person makes the final call with all of that information, with all of the recommendations, yay or nay, from that multi-stage 
review. Like I said, I'm, I, there's no guarantee that they get everything right, but they try to get a lot of input information and many perspectives. That's a much different system, I think you'll agree, than what exists down on Grant Street, where Mr. Zapala can say, well, yeah, why not? Right? So if they decide they're going to go for the death penalty, um, they in the federal system, just as an example, um, in the charge, they'll have to say there are two things that tell us that this is a, a death penalty case. Number one, if the state with the mental state is for the crime, we believe the defendant, uh, uh, that there's evidence that the defendant uh, fulfills the mental state. Every crime, except for just a few, in all the serious crimes, you look at the statute, it will require a certain mental state, a particular mental state, right? To intentionally kill, that's a mental state, intentionally, right? Um, and then they have to talk about at least one aggravating Factor. There's that word again. Patience, please. I will come back to it. I'm going to fully define it. But remember, an aggravating factor is just something that makes a case serious enough to qualify for the death penalty. It could be something like multiple victims killing in a particularly awful way. You can imagine. And I'm going to be very specific in a few minutes. So once capital punishment is sought, whether it's state or federal, now you have certain gears in the system engaged, and we know certain things are going to happen. What do those things look like? Number one, there's going to be a special jury selection process. Right? Number two, you're going to have that two-stage bifurcated trial. Guilt phase, penalty phase. Same jury, but two, essentially two separate trials on two different questions. Number three, same jury, I just said that, excuse me. Um, in the penalty phase, the jury will decide the sentence. Is it going to be a death penalty? Is it going to be life in prison? Um, and then it's important to understand that in many capital cases, not all, but in many, there's not going to be a big debate about who did it or whether the person is guilty or not. The real debate is about what the penalty is going to be. This is not true all the time, but it's true often enough that I thought it's important to bring this out. And this really does bring us back to something um, that, we, that we, we talked about just at the beginning here. Uh, and that's because we sit in the adversary system, because the lawyers are bringing these different points of view and challenging each other. For a lot of capital cases, a significant number of them, the defense is going to be focused all on what we call mitigation or finding and presenting mitigating factors. They're going to be looking to humanize the accused who has done something really bad, all right? And this will stick in the crawl of a lot of people, but understand that that's really their job. In the context of the system we have, this is what we should expect them to do. This is why they're there. Right? So again, just you know, going all the way back to why we're here tonight, if we know to expect this, Perhaps it will not affect us quite the same way when we see it. Now, how do we proceed? Here's the trial process. Let's really dig into this, All right? The jury. We know what that looks like. 12 members of the community. It's not a jury of your peers. That's a misnomer. It's a fair cross-section of the community, All right? But in the context of a capital case, there are going to be some important differences. Number one, um, since uh, uh, you have a case in which there may have been publicity, if that's the case, if this is a well-known case, um, you might indeed be summoning a much larger pool of possible jurors, because lots of people will have heard of it. 
right? One thing that courts will get in a case like that is a motion to change the venue, to move the trial out of this jurisdiction and into another one because you can't get a fair jury in this one. Right? That's a very common thing when there is any notoriety to the case. Doesn't mean it's more or less serious. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is more people know, and that may change things. And sometimes a judge will grant a change of venue or even pull a jury from a different venue into the one where the trial is taking place. I mean, you may remember that from the Cosby case, right? The case itself was all based in Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia, excuse me, Bucks County, was that? Something like that. Um, and the jury was pulled from Allegheny, right? These are ways to meet that same challenge. But really, it goes deeper than just this. There is a special way that capital cases juries have to be examined. Remember, we talked last week about getting information from jurors. In the run the mill case, it's a couple of pages of a survey with your demographic information, and some other basic things, and you mail it in after you get your jury summons. In a case with a lot of public notice, uh, that survey might be a very detailed questionnaire. Hundreds of questions even, right? Uh, but it's more than that. Um, in a capital case, have to go through a special qualification process when they're asking the jurors those questions. And remember, those are there to ferret out potential biases to see if there might be a reason that the juror can't be fair. We have a special set of questions. Uh, and this is that phrase, death qualified. Some time ago, Supreme Court in the Witherspoon case and a couple of cases that have followed it came to the conclusion that if you had a person who was called for jury duty on a death penalty case and they said, I am unalterably opposed to the death penalty, well, that means they can't be fair. And the Supreme Court said that excludes them. They are not death qualified. If the juror just says, well, I'm against capital punishment, but I could impose it if it was called for. Oh, no. Yeah, then those people are not automatically excluded. This is the idea of being death qualified. So you get a question and a series of questions, really, to the jurors that look something like this. Would you be able to impose a death sentence law and the facts called for it? If you say absolutely not, you're gone. If that's a more general sort of thing, like I was describing, just general objections. I don't think it's always fair, but you know, if the law says so, I would, then they stay, right? This will change the makeup of the jury. The flip side is supposed to be life qualification. This is another Supreme Court case. Would you be able to impose a life sentence in a capital case if the law and the facts called for it? If you say absolutely not, every, effectively everybody deserves the death penalty if charged, um, then you're excused. But most people are going to say, well, yeah, I, sure, of course. Right? I think you can understand where these things lead. But death qualified means what it says. Every juror that ends up on a death penalty case is going to be asked that question on the left side. And if they say, I'm, you know, I'm against the death penalty, they cannot serve. That's death qualification for jurors. On we go. Into the trial itself, again, two phases, right? The guilt phase and the penalty phase. They are separate, but they use the same jury. That jury has a lot of work ahead of it. So there's a full-scale trial on the question of guilty or not guilty to the crime or crimes charged. All of them, you know, there could be a lot of them in any particular case. And it goes like any other trial, got to be settled by a unanimous vote beyond a reasonable doubt. And people testify, and the defense may or may not put on a case, just like we were talking about last week. All right? It, it, it will not look different 
than what we talked about last week in this phase. Um, there is only one question on the floor. Is the defendant guilty or not guilty of all or one charge? All right? There's witnesses, all kinds, whoever's called for, and other evidence, but only on the question of guilt. Nobody gets to talk about the punishment, what the punishment should be, what's appropriate, nothing. It's only on did this person commit this crime as it is spelled out in the statute, state or federal? That's all, right? Now, this is one of the places where mental health may come up, may, just a possibility. If the person who is accused has a severe enough mental health issue, there could be an insanity defense. And not all states have the insanity defense anymore. And the Supreme Court has said, that's fine. We'd have to have a whole other class to understand that. Um, but the insanity defense still exists. Contrary to what most people think, it is not asserted very often. The stakes have to be very high, for one thing, because most people don't want an insanity defense inserted uh, asserted for them. Um, uh, but this is one of those times when the stakes are very high. Right? So it's possible to see this. But the standard for qualifying somebody, for finding somebody not guilty by reason of insanity is much higher, much more difficult to meet than people think. So it's not used as much as you would believe from watching television and movies. And it succeeds even less often than it's used. Right? Jurors are very skeptical of it, in my experience. But this is a place where it could come up, could. All the evidence comes in, jur the judge instructs the jurors on the law, and the jury makes a decision, just like in any other case. Given the law, do the facts support a decision that the person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? If not, not guilty, the jury exits. Because that, you know, unless there's a finding of guilt on something that the that the death penalty would apply to, the jury is done. Let's assume for purposes of our discussion that there's no doubt about guilt, or the jury simply finds a person guilty, and on we go into the second phase. But as we do that, I think it'd be useful to think about something that does happen in capital cases. Not always, but sometimes. What if there's no real question about guilt? What if there's no question about who did it or that the person is guilty enough under the statute, they're gonna be found guilty, they are guilty. Right? What are we doing? What's that guilt phase for? What's that all about in a case like that? Right? Um, and I have some answers and I'd be willing to discuss this further uh, in questions and answers, if you want. Uh, always remember, those two things apply in this kind of case, as well as in any other case. We're still in the adversary system. That enables the defense, the accused, to challenge the prosecution, even if that's all that the defense decides to do. And the prosecution still has the burden of proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt, no matter how certain guilt seems. It's part of the system. It's built into the system so the government can't do the things that governments do when that guarantee is not there. And I don't think any of us want to live in those societies. So these are our two underlying assumptions. Given that, the defense can simply say, okay, prove it. You know, the defense doesn't have to put on any defense. Nobody has to testify and is perfectly entitled to say, all right, prove it. Let's see your evidence. It happens. The defense can also say, you know what? I want to plead guilty to the crimes in the guilt phase but without any regard to the penalty. I'm not saying I'm going to accept any particular penalty, but I'm going to plead guilty to the crime or crimes, right? Without any agreement on what the penalty should be. Can do that. It's allowed. It does sometimes happen. There can also be a plea agreement. 
in which there is no, there's not going to be a guilt phase, essentially, of a trial. The defendant will plead guilty, but the whole trial will be about the penalty. We we'll just go right into the penalty phase. But nothing forces the defendant to do any one of those things. It is a choice among options, right? And as difficult as it is, as I said at the beginning, to, to, to do things in a fair and squared up way for a person we don't think deserves it, this is what we have to do, right? We want our system to reflect our values. We got to do it. We have to do it even when we don't think it should happen. Occasionally. I've heard of, I can think of one, hearing about one case like this. Person pleads guilty and asks for an imposition of the death penalty. I deserve it. Sentence me to death. I, I can think of one. That's it. So now we're in the penalty phase. Assume that the defendant has been found guilty of at least one crime, one that calls for capital punishment. We're in the penalty phase. How does this work? All right. Same jury. Question now is a death sentence or a life sentence? And now we get to aggravating and mitigating factors. Now these are the entire substance. These are what the penalty phase is about, all right? And we have to also consider the very special role that victims play in this phase. Very important, all right? The jury is basically going to be asked five questions when you sort it all out. And I want to just put these in front of you first, and then we'll talk about how this stuff is done. Question number one, does the defendant have the required mens rea? I talked about this a minute ago, the required mental state. We just make up a funny Latin term for this, mens rea, intent. You know, what was the person's intent? Does the person have the required mental state in that statute that carries the death penalty of which they were found guilty. You could think of this as being eligible for the death penalty. Number two, is there at least one aggravating factor? I don't even know if aggravator is a real word, but is there one aggravator? Is there evidence of one aggravator in the penalty phase? Number three, what about any mitigators, mitigating factors uh, held in the mind of just one juror? We'll talk about that in a minute. Or do the aggravators outweigh the mitigators? If they do, should the defendant be sentenced to death or, oops, to death or life in prison? Oops, there we go. There we are. So, Essentially, five questions. Those are the things that the jurors are going to be asked to sort through. How do they do it? How does the evidence come to them? Worth mentioning, all of them have to be by unanimous decision. The third one, the presence of a mitigating factor, doesn't have to be because it's coming from the defense side and one mitigating factor it's, is capable of raising a reasonable doubt, right? Everything else must be decided unanimously. So what is an aggravating factor? Well, I gave you the general description, which is something that would pull you towards the death penalty, makes it more serious, all right? This is the federal list, and it would look a lot like this in any state. Multiple victims, vulnerable victims, Murder for hire, for money, show, murder showing substantial planning, a particularly heinous, cruel, or depraved manner of killing. Those are all right in the statute. And then there are so-called non-statutory factors, factors that have been found to qualify as aggravating factors that are not mentioned in the statute, a pattern of violent behavior, future dangerousness, lack of remorse, or impact on the victims. These are all things that qualify as aggravating factors. 
And the job of the prosecution, if it has decided to, pr to pursue the death penalty in a penalty phase, is to bring evidence on these. And they'll do it. If they have gone that far, they're ready for this. And they'll bring it. These are the things that will pull the jury towards the death penalty. How about mitigating factors? And you see the image on the left side. This is a mental health professional testifying in some case. Very common to see that, right? What kind of things? These are the ones in the statute. Mental impairment for the mental health professional. Being under duress. The fact that another defendant in the case who is equally culpable as the person on trial got a non-death sentence. That's an, a mitigating factor. Uh, having no prior criminal record is a mitigating factor. And then, quote, other factors in the defendant's background, record, or character. You can see that's pretty open-ended. You can imagine how uh, in, you know, when you read about a capital case, how there will be testimony about the defendant's background, childhood, upbringing, terrible things that have happened, those kind of things. That's where, this is where that's coming from. All right. This is the job of the defense, just like it's the job of the prosecutor to present no evidence of the aggravating factors. It is the job of the defense to present these. And again, remember, it's the adversary system. The jury is being exposed to evidence from two very different directions with two very different purposes and goals in mind. It's designed that way. Here we go. All right. The victim's roles. Let's talk about this for just a minute. All right. In the past, as I said last week, victims were just witnesses. And that was only if, only if the prosecution found them useful. Oftentimes, victims were the forgotten people in the equation. Now, they have rights to be heard, to be notified about the trial, and to speak in trials in certain very specific ways. Um, in a capital case, you have the uh, particular victims being heard uh, through particular kinds of testimony and statements at particular points in the trial. I'm going to get very much more specific about this in a moment. All right. So what would this look like? In the penalty phase, when we're deciding on the penalty, victims that get heard at the penalty phase, family members of the deceased, people who were injured, folks like that. Think of that as the sort of the, in, the tightest circle of the concentric circles of people impacted by the case. Right? They can testify to the impact the crime has had on the family. Scope of injury, scope of loss. They cannot talk about or testify about what the sentence should be, what they think is an appropriate punishment, not during the sentencing phase. Uh, in the words of the Supreme Court, in a case called Payne versus Tennessee, they can give uh, family members, that is, can, quote, give a quick glimpse of the life of each victim in this penalty phase testimony. In the end, you bring all this together, the aggravating factors, the mitigating factors, the testimony of, uh, of the deceased family uh, and other people who were injured by the crime. And this is a quote from the statute. I'm sorry, there's a lot of text on the screen, but it's basically what it's describing is a balancing. In the end, the jury must consider whether all the aggravating factors found to exist sufficiently outweigh all the mitigating factors found to exist to justify a sentence of death. They bring it together, they balance it, and the jury makes the decision. Now, one more wrinkle, I promise. Rarely, we have something called not a bifurcated trial, but a trifurcated trial. This is essentially a splitting of the penalty phase into two parts. You still have the same guilt phase. Penalty phase is split, right? Here's how it works. You have 
penalty phase one, is the defendant eligible for the death penalty? We go through that mental state thing again. Does he have the mental state? And is there at least one aggravator? In a trifurcated trial in phase one of the penalty phase, no victim impact statements, right? Now, doing this, the trifurcated procedure is not required by law, but sometimes a judge will do this out of an abundance of caution. That's the phrase you see. So that's the eligibility part. Penalty phase two, should the defendant receive a death sentence or a life sentence? You balance the aggravating versus the mitigating factors again. And here, the victims may speak. That tightest circle of victims, the families of people who are who were murdered, uh, same scope of the testimony. And then on the balance, is it a death sentence or a life sentence? Now, why would this be done? Well, it's the defense that wants it. And why? The initial decision about whether the defendant is eligible for the death penalty is made without victim testimony. That is the strategic calculation. They figure it's one extra way that they could stop the train. But remember, that's their job. All right. Now, we're pretty much at the end, except for now, once the jury has decided on the penalty, there is going to be a sentencing hearing. And it may be that in any particular case, the sentence is kind of determined. If there's, for instance, one charge eligible for capital punishment and the jury said capital punishment, well, the judge is going to impose a sentence of death. But not all cases are like that. Some cases will include a number of charges, some of which are possibly death sentenced and others of which are not. There's still going to be a need to do a sentencing hearing in any case. All right. So there's that. And then you have the federal statute about the victim's rights. The CVRA that kicks in, gives a formal right to be heard under the law. And a much wider circle of people may testify at the sentencing hearing as victims. So you could still have the families of the deceased the families of the murder and the people injured, but you might also have other people, you know, people from other groups who were somehow injured by this, impacted by this, people in the city, people in whatever organization, uh, and they can give a wider degree of testimony. Now, everybody is allowed to say, we think the penalty should be fill in the blank. All right, so that's the major thing that's added. Many more people, oftentimes those statements are written. They're not, they don't have to be oral, but some will be oral, right? And then the judge pronounces the sentence. So just one more thing. We talked about having expectations, right? There is no assurance of any particular outcome in a capital case. I think sitting here, we can all remember examples from the news of a surprising outcome, one way or the other, in any particular capital case. It's just good to keep that in mind. So why are we doing this? This brings us all the way back to the beginning. Why do this? Especially for the worst of the worst, which is, you know, that's what we're supposed to be talking about with capital punishment, right? It's not just the law. Yes, we have capital punishment in the federal system, in Pennsylvania, in this state or that state. That's not a sufficient answer. Why go through all this? It's not just what the Supreme Court said in Greg versus Georgia, you need these safeguards, you need aggravators, blah, 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 blah. Again, again, it's about who we are. It's about our values, our values, right? It's hard to do justice in a terrible case. And we will fail sometimes. We are people. We are human. Our system is created by humans. We won't always make it, but we're going to try. We're going to try because that's 
who we are. I told you it's on my wall. Okay. Special thanks there to John, to Marshall, to Jeff, Maggie and Renisa, Emery, who ran our tech. Thank you. I'm ready for your questions. If, if the governor has to sign off on state death sentences, does anyone have to sign off on federal ones? The question, did everybody hear the question? Um, does, does anybody sign off on federal death sentence? I believe the attorney general signs off on them. I could be wrong about that. I will check and I'll get the answer back to Maggie and Renisa. So thank you. If a jury needs to be unanimous on the sentence and they're not able to come to a conclusion, will there, will, will there be a mistrial or will the whole trial have to start over? If I'm understanding the question right, we're at the penalty phase. Question is death sentence or life sentence. If they can't agree unanimously on a death sentence, I believe the default position is life sentence because the person has already been found guilty. So it becomes a life sentence. If the person is found guilty in a life sentence without parole, are they in general population? Oh, um, are they in general population, a life sentence without parole? They can be. They can be, yes. Um, it, is not, it, it is not the case that they aren't under some restrictions, but those restrictions would tend to be more individual and behavior-based and so forth but they're simply on a life sentence without parole like anybody else would be. That's the general understanding. In the death penalty sentence, are they also in general population or solitary confinement? Uh, if a person is under a death sentence, they're usually confined in a special area for, other, for only people under death sentences. It's what we commonly call death row, right? Um, it's not actually a row of cells necessarily, but there is a special area within the prison system of any state or in the federal government in which people are un who are under a death sentence. Uh, those are the only folks there. That's where you serve your time until such time as your execution. How does having multiple attorneys affect a case? Will it change the order? or what is expected during a trial. So would each attorney get to cross-examine a witness individually? Very interesting question. Um, I know in the federal system, there are requirements. Oh, sure, yes. Uh, it was about the number of attorneys. The number of attorneys. Uh, does, does the number of attorneys change how things are done? Would each attorney necessarily get chances at cross-examination and other things that happen during a trial? Did I get that right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, the in federal system, there's a requirement that there be at least two attorneys, um, and sometimes there are more. Uh, they have to have a certain level of expertise, experience, and so forth. Um, often the case in state systems too. Um, but if there's one thing that stands out uh, for cases uh, under a death sentence being reversed. It is the abominable quality of legal representation in some states. Uh, some of the worst uh, uh, cases in the area of ineffective assistance of counsel that I've ever read, and I've read plenty of them, uh, come from states that appoint people who basically don't do any criminal work, drunks, people who fall asleep, uh, lawyers who are just pliable because the judge wants to get rid of the case, things like that. So um, it makes a big difference in who those lawyers are. When you have a, a system like the federal government, which requires that the attorneys have some level of competence and experience, it can make a big difference. Do they all get a chance to do certain things? This is very much determined by the defense team itself. Uh, often there is a person on the team, whether it's two lawyers or three, who specializes in mitigation getting, presenting, finding those mitigating factors. Because as I told you, often that's the whole game. 
And so there are people who really specialize in that. Sometimes those people aren't even lawyers, but they're part of the team, right? So there's no hard and fast rule about who will do what. There will almost always be more than one lawyer um, and um, they divide it up, up uh, you know, based on their expertise. Why is trifurcated trial so rare? Um, why is it so rare? Um, it's kind of a good question. I don't, I don't know why maybe every time they wouldn't, uh, defense wouldn't ask for it, but it's just not that common. Um, maybe it doesn't pay off very often. And if there are other avenues to work on other ways to try the case, maybe those are more fruitful. Um, maybe it only gets done where there are very few other cards to play, if you will excuse my use of the metaphor. That's my best guess. Does a judge have to give his or her okay on a plea bargain? Does a judge have to give his or her okay for a plea bargain? It depends on the state. Um, some states require it as part of their rules of criminal procedure. But I can't think of any court in which you'd have a serious, uh, a real capital case, uh, and the judge wouldn't uh, uh, feel that he or she will or won't approve it. Right? Sometimes there are situations where you know judge doesn't care, or there's you know the cases going through a court are not that serious in the grand scheme of things. But a death penalty case, you will not get a plea bargain through a court without a judge saying okay. What happens if a federal conviction of a death penalty in a state that prohibits death penalties? Where would execution occur if that was the outcome? Okay, so you're in a state with no death penalty, let's say like New York State, but then the federal government comes in and runs a second trial, let's say, or even first trial, and gets a verdict of a death sentence. That's our, that's our question, right? Where would the execution take place? Not It wouldn't have to be in that state. Um, you may remember uh, the name Timothy McVeigh, man convicted of the uh, terrorist bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma, killed over 160 people, including a lot of children and so forth. Um, he was sentenced to death, and he died in the federal execution chamber in Terre Haute, Indiana. I don't know at this time if there's another one uh, but that's where Timothy McVeigh was taken to be executed. So it wouldn't have to be in the state where the crime took place. Does the attorney general have to write their position on pursuing the death penalty? As a general matter, the attorney general doesn't have to write or explain their general position on pursuing the death penalty. Um, you would think. That I mean, the attorney general is nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, is uh, usually a trusted member of the of the president's party, and is going to have policies and practices and beliefs in mind that roughly, more than roughly, will square up with the beliefs of the president. And it would be kind of unusual for uh, an attorney general to have a big difference on something as important as capital punishment. Um, but the attorney general doesn't have to explain herself in advance or anything like that and simply makes the decision in individual cases. And I don't think there has been uh, any kind of a policy statement out of an attorney general that I can remember where the person says, I'm for, I'm against the death penalty and therefore I will carry out this duty in this particular way. Do you know where the capital punishment uh, system was inherited from? Um, well, back at the beginning of the United States, um, most nations had it. Um, you know, you really have to think about the, the nature of the system when our country started. There just weren't that many crimes in books. There were some. Um, and there were only a few felonies, right? Um, and those felonies pretty much all carried capital punishment, all of them, right? 
Uh, death was usually by hanging. Um, the other stuff, they would just put you in the stocks. You know what that is, that thing, or the pillory. And, you know, they put a little sign on you, this person's a thief or something like that. And people throw rotten fruit at you and you have to stand there for a week or, you know, spit on you or something like that. Or they shame you in some other way. Uh, I was serious when I said that there really weren't any penitentiaries back then. There were no people serving these long jail sentences. You could be held for certain things, including being in debt. Um, but the capital punishment system, such as it is, was really, you know, like half the justice system. Because, you know, you committed any of these, you're going to get hanged. And that's it. Uh, and it wasn't different in other countries. They all use capital punishment. Um, but cultures sometimes differed. Right, we're talking about nation states in the first instance. There's a fascinating story that I read not long ago about pre-United States, a murder taking place. Uh, took uh, was done by a couple of, I guess you could call them colonists back at that time, two white men. Uh, they went in and they murdered uh, members of uh, an indigenous tribe. I think it one or two people. And they would have, you know, been found guilty and executed in the regular course of things. But this particular tribe went to the de facto government, the colonial government, whatever it was, and said, no, we don't do it that way. We want a form, you could call it you know, a form of restorative justice. We will not have somebody executed for this. There will be a penalty. It will be like this. There will be an apology. It'll be like this. And this was all written into a treaty back in the 1760s or something. I wish I could remember the details better than that. But it's, it's important to mention even if the nation states that existed were all doing this, not every culture accepted it that way. What was happening in 1975 that had so many death penalties? <laughs> um, great question. You know, uh, if you look at uh, crime statistics and prison statistics, things were pretty flat from the beginning of the 20th century into the 1960s. And all of a sudden with the 1960s, uh, we can all remember some reasons that there was social turmoil. You think campuses, you think the war, you think uh, civil rights movement, you think uh, unrest in cities, all kinds of things. Uh, but crime really began to go up in a way that was historic and had not been the case before. And this continued into the 70s. And the reaction uh, was not necessarily well-informed and kind. Uh, we began to see our uh, prison populations go up, but not in the way they went up in the 80s and 90s. That was a special thing, a special experiment. Um, but the death penalty, which had existed, um, you know, you, all of a sudden you had many more death sentences being handed down. Now, I, I can't stand here and tell you I know the reason for this, but I can speculate as much as anybody can. And I would just say it was a reaction to both the increase in crime and seeming social instability and our leaders saying, well, here's the answer. We're just gonna, we're gonna do more of this. And you had a series of political leaders through the 1960s that sort of pioneered the idea of using crime as a political wedge issue, uh, using crime and a war on crime and a, things like that as a way of putting out coded racial messages about suppressing certain people and certain people need to be kept in their place and so forth. And so you had uh, uh, two very you know, important names, Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California, and Richard Nixon, who became president, really using the crime issue in a way that politicians before them had not at the very highest levels of American society. And that kind of thing, I think, had a lot to do with capital punishment uh, really taking off. Can you then speculate what is making the death penalty less preferable now? Oh, sure. Um, there's some fascinating books about this. Uh, one written by my friend Brandon Garrett, and I wish I could remember the name of the book. Maybe I'll remember it as I'm talking. Um, uh, all about how the death penalty, I mean, the, is the, the question is, is the death penalty dying? And you can see the graph. I mean, it's, it's just going down. There are several things that account for this. Number one, um, we have seen since the very late 80s and early 90s, 
um, that there is less reason to be trusting of the criminal justice system generally, right? And the reason I say that is uh, the uh, the advent of DNA as uh, a forensic tool. Um, the um, um, DNA revolution, I don't think that's too strong a word, has resulted in hundreds of exonerations since the late 1980s, and a strong number of them were people who were in death row. I mean, you went through this whole process, the aggravators, the mitigators, blah, 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 all this two-stage two trial, and we're still getting wrongful convictions and putting people on death row. There's reasonably good evidence that some people on death row were innocent and were executed anyway. Right? So I think that's that's got to be something that we think about. Number two, uh, there's been a realization, I mean, it was always there, but a real strong realization that capital punishment is very expensive uh, relative to other kinds of trials and other kinds of punishment. It just costs way more to go through that process than it does to run a regular trial with uh, a penalty like life without parole. Now, that sounds very crass to say it's expensive and therefore, you know, we're not doing as much, but you put yourself in the position of a county executive or a district attorney uh, in maybe a rural county or a place that isn't, you know, isn't particularly wealthy. And you got to ask yourself, what's my budget for this trial? You know, I mean, it's a real question. And I think a lot of places, it just has kind of fallen out of favor with that. Uh, number three is the many, the much greater use of the life without parole sentence. And there's been some real court litigation about the availability of that sentence and does the jury have to be told about it in those terms? And when juries know that that's the alternative, that the person is never getting out, they are less likely to sentence to death. Those are three explanations I would give you. There are others. Can victims be cross-examined? Victims at the penalty phase could, in theory, be cross-examined. They could. Remember, at the penalty phase, the victims are explaining uh, the impact on them. Uh, they're talking about their murdered family members. They are talking about the impact uh, of their own injuries, things like that. Um, they are witnesses at that stage. So I say in theory, though, because a lawyer is going to have to be very careful and very, very foolish, just my opinion, to engage in that in any kind of a way it's going to get them anywhere. All right. So I, if it was me, I would not look forward to that task and I would look maybe for ways to make my point in other ways, but they could be. At the sentencing phase, now we're not in the cross-examination, direct examination stuff anymore. It's, it's just about the sentence, and they're making statements to the defendant, to the court, to the community. So it really doesn't work the same way. Thank you. Well. That was some really good rapid fire questions. <laughs> so well done. Um, so I just wanted to say really quickly, thank you so much. And also that you should expect to get um, a survey from us. Um, if there's information that you'd like to know, if we didn't get to something that you really want to know, I mean, tonight I can feel there's a lot of questions for good reason. Um, please put that in the survey and let us know what you think, what you would want to know more about. All right. And thank you again for, for participating. And thank you to Professor Harris. And I just want to say, before we all leave, let's thank Maggie, Renisa, Emery, the whole 1027 staff for putting this together. And I personally thank them for the opportunity to do this. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful partners. Thank you.